as promised, next up we are going to be talking about um, the primary, the premier largest industry in New Mexico, which is the oil and gas business. And we didn't want to get through this virtual roundhouse without letting the Oil and Gas Association talk about what's going on in the industry, what's happening in the legislative session, uh, because again, it is an economic driver in our state. It impacts so many communities across. across the state. And so um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Ryan Flynn from the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association. And he is going to take some time to, again, talk about the work of the association, talk about the state of the industry, talk about their plans for 2021, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, and sort of highlight some of the points of the legislative session. So I don't want to take away from his time. So Ryan, I will drop off and monitor the chat room for you and let you know as the questions come in, but the stage is yours. All right, can you hear me okay, Kathy, before you drop off? Perfect, you sound great. All right, great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm gonna share my screen and, um, and let's see, hopefully this will work. And hopefully, um, I don't know if anyone can see, but hopefully my presentation is up on the screen right now. Not seeing it yet. Okay. It's not, there we go. Um, why does it not want to? There we go. Okay, does that work? Are we, are we? There, yep, you're on. All right, there we go. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, there's so much activity occurring right now in the oil and gas sector and New Mexico has been the focal point of the oil and gas industry for the last couple of months. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, New Mexico, a lot of people outside of the southeastern portion of the state and the northwestern portion of the state, which are, are producing regions, are surprised when they hear that New Mexico is the third largest oil producer in the United States and the United States is the largest producer of oil in the world. We have now supplanted Russia and Saudi Arabia as being the number one producer of oil and gas in the world. So um, quite a bit of activity occurs in New Mexico. And then the last couple of months, we've really taken center stage because of uh, the historic nomination of Congresswoman uh, Deb Holland to be the Secretary of Interior, as well as a uh, confluence of federal policy decisions, which will uh, play out directly in New Mexico. So I'll talk a little bit about all of this and um, really leave time for questions if there are questions at the end of my presentation. So with that, I'll um, start by just talking a little bit about where the industry is today and where uh, what we've seen over the last year. Notwithstanding some of the greatest challenges we've we've really ever experienced as an industry in terms of a major reduction in demand for our products we still had a record year of production in 2020, which really is both remarkable and evidence of the resilience of the industry in New Mexico in particular. We had, uh, because people were not moving as a result of the pandemic, and you saw just a huge reduction in demand for oil and gas products. You know, at, at we've, we've continued to move products uh, through you know air travel, but we really haven't seen the numbers increase for a year now for a air travel. And then vehicle traffic, we've seen some um, bright spots where we've seen some increase in activity, but still you know huge portions of the population, including right here in New Mexico, are doing um, are are working from home and working remotely in order to protect um, their families and their communities. And so because of those measures uh, that are obviously really important to protecting the public during the pandemic, we saw a major reduction in demand for oil and gas products. That's why the fact that we still had a record year of production in New Mexico is really remarkable. And um, I think it speaks to the fact that the industry in the Permian Basin is the most resilient and stable sector of the entire industry in the United States. 
And really the only thing that can disrupt the industry in the Permian is policy. Prices, which used to historically drive production, are no longer um, a major factor in terms of maintaining high levels of production in the Permian Basin. It's really policy is, the, is really the only limiting factor for record setting production and really high levels of production to continue. Last year, the industry generated $2.8 billion of revenue for the state budget. And that is in just direct revenue. That's not starting, if you start getting into indirect revenue, the numbers become well over um, $17 billion when you look at the economic activity associated with the industry. But if you just look at royalties and taxes paid directly to the state, the industry provided $2.8 billion to the state. We are by far and away the largest source of revenue for the state of New Mexico. And that revenue obviously goes to fund, you know, each, every, every government service, everything that we provide as a state government comes from a, a large portion of that comes directly from oil and gas taxes that are paid to the state. Of that $2.8 billion, $1.4 billion went toward public education in New Mexico. So largest source of revenue for the state and, and the largest source of revenue for public education in the state. And that's one of the reasons why the industry, while it is really active in certain regions of the state, the entire state sees the impacts of the oil and gas industry, really from a revenue perspective. You, you know, in Santa Fe, there's no oil and gas activity that's that's ever going to occur uh, in Santa Fe County, aside from uh, filling up your, your car at a pump. Um, otherwise, we're not really producing anything in Santa Fe or, or Bernalillo County or Doña Ana County. Really, it's, it's limited to the regions I mentioned in the Southeast and Northwest, but the benefits flow to each and every county through the state government revenue and public education revenue that's provided by the industry. Quite frankly, when we're doing well, the state has more resources and opportunities to do things, whether it be increasing teacher pay uh, or providing you know, additional tax incentives to try to diversify our, our economy, something we certainly as an industry support. So New Mexico is unique compared to Texas in that we have a lot of land where oil and gas activity occurs that's actually owned by either the federal government or the state government. And so because of some major policy events I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, activity on federal lands has been really um, something that's been talked about all across the country. I mean, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, I mean, everyone uh, has been talking about New Mexico production on federal lands because of um, the appointment of Congresswoman Woman Holland and uh, Biden administration policies regarding oil and gas development on federal lands. So of the $2.8 billion that New Mexico that the New Mexico oil and gas industry provided to the state last year, 1.5 billion of that, uh, the royalty came from activity on federally owned and managed lands. So we have lands that are owned and managed by the state through the land office, lands that are owned by the federal government through the Bureau of Land Management, and then we have private land um, as well as um, activity on tribal lands uh, in the Northwest. So we have four different ownership structures in New Mexico. And most importantly, about 1.5 billion of that 2.8 came directly from federal royalties paid to the state. I mentioned before that the 54% of oil and gas revenue came from activity on federal lands in New Mexico. So um, a pretty large amount of activity occurring there. Not, when you look at the national landscape, New Mexico is really critical to production on federal lands because 53% of the total federal oil production comes from New Mexico. And 59% of the total gas production comes from New Mexico. So New Mexico is by far and away the largest producer of oil and gas on federal lands in the United States. So we have a huge amount of production activity that occurs on federal lands in New Mexico, really driven primarily at this time by the Permian Basin, which is um, the epicenter of the oil and gas industry right now. 
The industry provides 134,000 jobs in the state. Again, we're the largest, not only source of revenue, but the largest industry employer in the state. Last year, we had a record 117 rigs. And so rig count is a really important metric for the industry because it speaks to how much new production people are bringing online. It also is an economic indicator because each rig provides approximately 50 to 70 jobs per rig. And those jobs, the average wage, wages are over $80,000 a year. So rig count is an important indicator of uh, where the industry is going in the state. And it was really high about a year ago. And I'll mention here um, in a little while to talk about where rig count is today because it hasn't quite recovered, um, even though prices have recovered. So the last year, our industry, like so many other industries, really um, had to survive. And you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, we were we were facing something a challenge that we've never seen before as a society. I mean, we we've in our the last I think century uh, or a little bit over a century between the last global pandemic, society has has rapidly changed in terms of our transportation infrastructure, how we. Um, how we move, move about, not only within uh, the boundaries of our state and our nation, but also globally, and how we engage in commerce all across the globe. Um, so all of, you know, all of those challenges that we've we faced in response to the public health um, crisis that we faced really had a huge impact on our industry as well. And again, I know we were not, certainly not alone. There were a lot of people and industries who suffered during this time but um, oil and gas really went through uh, an incredibly trying stretch. And I would just mention here, uh, I love these pictures because I don't, you know, I don't know how many um, parents are on the line, but um, you know, I, I'm, it, it was really incredibly challenging, I think, just speaking personally, having to adjust. And now I think we're finally getting the hang of it, but um, gosh, going from being a teacher helping your children to balancing your job and to um, really you know trying to adjust to this new normal during the pandemic was incredibly difficult certainly for me as a, a working parent and uh, I really have a newfound appreciation um, for um, for for computer technology since uh, I was not that great at it um, before I started homeschooling my my children uh, but really, presented huge challenges for our industry, like so many other industries. Um, this is the one interesting point I would make, and I'll kind of move quickly through the rest of my presentation. But when it comes to rig count that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, um, typically rig count will increase. People will bring more rigs into the state when there's an increase in prices. And so production has been very stable and high, but you would have expected to actually see production continue to increase. And that's been what's what, what we've seen over the last five years in New Mexico, where you've seen production continuously re remain high and increasing. And right now, even though prices have recovered uh, to pre-pandemic le levels, the rig count has remained very low. And if I look at the slide, if you look to the right of the screen, you see the green line re references the, the weekly price of oil in the United States. And then the blue bar graph shows the how many rigs are in the state on a weekly basis. And so you see a huge gap all the way to the right of the screen between the, the green line and uh, the blue bar graph reflecting that rigs new drilling activity is not picking up with an increase in prices. And, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that, but primarily that's due to uncertainty regarding federal policy in New Mexico. And the reason why I believe very strongly that that's the case is because we've seen, if, you, if we put up the same chart in, uh, uh, and we showed the rig count in the Texas side of the Permian Basin, you would see actually a major uptick in rig count associated with the uptick in WTI weekly price. So federal policy absolutely does impact how people are viewing investments in capital moving forward in the state. Notwithstanding the fact that we're not seeing um, the same type of new production we would expect to see given prices, the Permian Basin, which New Mexico shares with Texas, is by far and away the most um, important 
strategic oil field in the United States. And it really is the epicenter of the American oil and gas industry, which is the, the top producing um, oil uh, industry in the world. So the Permian Basin is hugely important and will continue to remain important. Like I said, the only real potential factor to derail production in the Permian Basin in New Mexico is policy at either the state or federal level. There were two recent activities that occurred um, at the federal level, the first of which was much more disruptive than the second. And the first was a temporary order that was issued by the Department of Interior uh, the day after President Biden's inauguration. And really the problem with the order was that it had essentially froze all approvals from the New Mexico Bureau of Land Management, the state BLM office, which manages federal activity uh, in New Mexico. The, the Department of Interior put out a temporary order saying that uh, any and all authorizations for fossil fuel activities or for oil and gas activities, it actually exempted coal and it exempted oil and gas activities on tribal lands. It only applied to federal, um, federally managed public lands. Um, it said all activities are, need to be frozen, essentially. Only approvals could be made by a limited number of political appointees who were just installed at the agency. And so what we've seen as a result of that is that approvals for right-of-ways, for um, sundries, which are really, they, a sundry is a routine administrative deviation from a document you previously had obtained, like a permit. So you got a permit a couple months ago and you had to change by a couple of feet the depth of the well. Well, then you would file what's called a sundry with the Bureau of Land Management, just telling them this is the new well depth and they are routinely approved, um, as well as permits and other authorizations. And so we saw as a result of that order that regulatory activity has essentially ground to a halt. Um, typically, the state BLM office would approve somewhere around 300 permits um, a month and uh, uh, an equally high number of right of ways. Um, we saw over the last month, less than 20, I believe 19 permits were approved. We saw four right of way applications approved. Uh, and a handful of sundries. So you've essentially seen regulatory activity grind to a halt in the state as a result of this order. The, you know, what we hear a lot of from critics is that the industry has thousands and thousands of permits, just drill away on all of those permits. Well, there's two problems with that argument. Number one, as I mentioned, you know, our permits, it's not like a parking permit that just says go, you know, you or you have, you know, two hours to keep your car here. These are highly technical documents with engineering specifications contained throughout the document. So any, even if you have a permit, there are oftentimes going to be minor technical changes that need to be updated in that permit. And in order to get those changes approved, you, you file a sundry with the, your, your state BLM office and get approval to move forward. Well, because of this freeze, that activity has stopped. So many people with permits that were approved are unable to actually do anything with the permits because they can't get the sundries they need to drill in compliance with the law. The second issue is that even if you have a permit, you still need a pipeline to, in order to manage the oil and the gas that you're, you're developing from that well. And in order to connect a well to a pipeline, you need to get a right of way. And so without right of ways, Producers have to either elect not to produce their well and therefore deny revenue to the state, or they can truck or use rails to move oil from the well, which increases greenhouse gas emissions uh, and is increases costs for producers, um, as well as still needing to manage natural gas that you're producing along with the oil. Um, and at times that will increase flaring events so not having infrastructure in the form of pipelines and gathering lines in place when you do have a permit actually creates some major unintended consequences, either from a cost perspective or from an environmental perspective. So that 60 day order that we're still under today has created a huge amount of disruption for producers in the state and is actually going to cost New Mexico in the next year or two um, quite a bit of revenue. The second order, which I'll only briefly touch on because it really doesn't have a short term, much of a short term impact, was the president, the president's executive order on climate. 
And there, President Biden said, we're going to put a pause of an indefinite period of time on any new oil and gas leases uh, as they undergo a uh, programmatic review throughout the Department of Interior. In the short term, this really is not incredibly disruptive at all to the industry. And I think from an industry perspective, either, you know, I think we understand President Biden is going to move in a different direction and absolutely should have time as he forms his administration and gets his people in place in order to make sure that the program reflects the policy direction of this new administration. And I don't think anyone, I mean, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't criticize that desire. He's the president. He gets to put you know, his appointees into um, leadership positions and they need to develop their agenda and move forward. And so in the short term, this pause on new leases is not particularly disruptive. However, if that pause were to extend for half a year or an entire year or multiple years, then you'll have major economic consequences for the state. And that's where I started before talking about of that $2.8 billion that was generated from oil and gas revenue last year for the state of New Mexico, 1.5 billion came from activity on federal lands. So over time, you absolutely will see a longer term impact depending on how long that pause that they've put in place uh, remains in place. But in the short term, it hasn't really created much of a disruption for the industry other than making questions about capital investments in New Mexico become much more difficult um, as people have to determine, are we going to put $100 million into a new oil project in New Mexico over the next year? Or would that be a better investment on the Texas side of the, the Permian or in another region? Um, so certainly it has created, I think, challenges from a capital investment perspective, but not from a new production uh, perspective right now. Um, and this is what the long-term impacts, if we were to keep this um, in place for four years, like I said, you would go from having an order that's not incredibly disruptive today to it quickly becoming disruptive the longer it remains in place. Um, and you would have just a huge amount of revenue and jobs uh, at stake. And these were from a, a study conducted by uh, the University of Wyoming, as well as from the New Mexico Tax Research Institute. So federal leasing, ban, pause, whatever you want to call it, Today does not have a huge impact, but if it lasts for multiple months or years, then it will absolutely have a major revenue impact and job impact to the state. Um, the, the, the big issue that I mentioned previously, and I'll finish, with, uh, finish up after this slide, is where will people invest money in terms of making you know, investments in infrastructure or in projects in the oil and gas industry? And all of this uncertainty regarding federal policy absolutely is shifting investments away from New Mexico. So I think that means that from a longer term perspective, um, you're going to have a disruption to production levels in New Mexico as a result of uh, the pause or ban, um, again, depending on its duration. If after six months, the Biden administration were to determine that we've completed our programmatic and permitting review, these are our, these are our initiatives we're going to pursue. We're going, and these are some rulemakings we're going to engage in. And this is our provides clear direction as to this is the regulatory path forward um, regarding production of federal lands. Then I think you could actually see um, the uncertainty uh, be eliminated and um, people would be more willing to consider investing. But when we surveyed our over 1,000 members, uh, we had 86% say they would consider shifting new investments away from New Mexico if that um, this was before the, the ban or pause was announced. Um, and that's, that's it. I think um, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that, that anyone has if I haven't um, put you to sleep with all this oil talk early in the morning. So hopefully everyone was highly caffeinated before, uh, <laughs> before my presentation. We did give them a coffee break a little bit ago. So there we go, right, Kathy. And, and we do have some questions um, that were texted in. Um, and the first one is really around um, the current legislative session. So is there anything happening in the New Mexico legislative session? You, you really touched on the sort of the federal level of things, but what are some things that are happening at the state level that you're either um, excited about or that you're concerned about and that you think people should be aware of? Well, um, 
you know, I'm, I'll start with the positive because I'm an optimist by nature. Um, from a positive perspective, I think, um, you know, I'm really, I'm pleased that we as a state continue to prioritize um, public education and that that continues to be a priority um, under Governor Lujan Grisham. I think, you know, there, and it's not just because I care deeply about public education or, um, I mean, on a personal level, but uh, which I do, but from a, a professional perspective, you know, one of the most important components to attracting professionals to locate in New Mexico is our public education system. Whenever we survey people, um, executives within the industry about what are the key factors they will consider on whether to relocate and then whether to stay in an area, public schools are by far and away the single greatest factor. There's other factors like public safety um, and things, but, but really public education plays a huge role in attracting professionals to the state. So if we wanna grow our economy, we absolutely have to understand that public education is not only important for our children today, it's also important for our economy. So, um, so I'm pleased that, that we continue to see um, a priority um, among both political parties as well as our governor to invest and prioritize you know, public education and improving outcomes there. From an, putting on my purely oil and gas hat, gosh, there have been so many, uh, so many proposals that would, I mean, really that are designed to harm the industry or to drive the industry out of New Mexico. I mean, it's been remarkable how many bills are really directed squarely at the industry uh, and are, I think, are, aren't necessarily trying to do much in terms of increasing our, um, you know, the stringency of, of the environmental regulations. It seems to be much more punitive in nature. And so I've seen, you know, quite a bit of legislation that simply doesn't make sense. And I'm not just talking about the fracking ban that um, Senator Cedillo Lopez and the other senators on the, uh, other than Senator Cervantes uh, on the Senate Conservation Committee voted in favor of, you know, that, that in and of itself is irresponsible legislation since how are you, if you're going to ban oil and gas activity, then I think you need a plan in place to be able to replace that revenue. And I think, you know, Senator Stewart introduced a, a working group to start to consider how the state is going to replace fossil fuels over the longer term. And I actually think that's a much more forward looking idea is if you're going to get rid of our industry, you better have a plan. Uh, but simply moving a fracking ban in place without a plan is, is, is irresponsible and really just political theater because I don't think anyone actually wants that bill to move. But there's a lot of other bills that impact our industry that I think are just purely punitive. Um, whether it's you know, making, allowing people to sue the industry more, um, or which, again, I, I think we have a strong regulator. If, if, if we need more authority for our regulators, then let's work together to deal with that. But just creating a free for all where you can sue everyone, including the oil and gas industry, doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Um, as well as, you know, there's a number of bills to change our air quality regulations, which you know, typically we've we've always followed the Federal Clean Air Act, and I don't really see why um, we wouldn't want to pursue direction under the Federal Clean Air Act, especially you know since you know I think people have previously wanted to follow or oppose what's happening on the federal, the federal level. I do think it's better just to have consistency and having consistent regulatory framework with the federal um, government under the Clean Air Act makes a lot of sense to me. But th you know, there's quite a bit of legislation. I, I could sit here all day. I mean, we've we're, we're tracking about, our lobbyists is tracking about bills that would have a major negative impact on the oil and gas industry. And our approach is generally on each of these bills to try to understand what the goal is in terms of what the, you know, what the policy outcome that the sponsor is trying to achieve is. And if we can figure out a way to do it that makes sense, that's not going to be harmful to our industry, then we're always going to try to try to find that solution in that middle ground. And we, we're doing that uh, on, on certain pieces of legislation right now, but there's many others where there really wasn't, there's really not a plan. It's, it's more of a, a punitive measure that's just trying to send a message to our industry. And, um, you know, and that stuff is, it's hard to find a middle ground if someone just wants to keep it in the ground. Got it. Um, and so you, you actually touched on this briefly. One of the questions came through, um, 
about um, what kind of challenges you're, are you facing as an industry with these discrepancies between you've got federal federal regulations and then you have the state coming in. So can you can you talk a little bit more about how that is just as an ongoing challenge for the oil and gas industry? Yeah, I mean, it makes New Mexico a more complex regulatory environment. And I think the biggest, you know, people compare New Mexico to Texas constantly in our industry because, I mean, it's it makes sense. I mean, there's Texas, there's so much production occurring in Texas already throughout the state, but then we obviously share the Permian Basin. And so there's an, it's naturally, um, it's a natural comparison. And, you know, the one of the big differentiators is that Texas doesn't have any, any, of, of any significance, any public lands in the state. There's, you know, there's a, a, a less than 1% of public ownership of land in Texas. So it's a tiny fraction. Uh, New Mexico, we have, you know, obviously different regulatory landscapes depending on where you're operating. And even if you're operating on a, a portion of state land, you, because we have a checkerboard ownership pattern, you still may need to, to deal with both state and federal regulations as you put your project into place. So it's it's not a it's not something that we're not able to manage and, and adapt to. I mean, that's our job. If we want to do business here, we got to make sure we're complying with all the rules in place. And we certainly understand that and take that seriously. It does make it more complicated. And certainly whenever there's political transitions and there's policy changes, that just, you know, again, I'm not saying that that's wrong or right. That's 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 just life. We're gonna have different people come in and they're gonna they have a right. They've been elected to put in place their policies and they certainly have a right to do that but it does create the potential for there to be some change and which again it, it's not something that we it, you know that we fear um, it just makes it a little bit more complex but i think the good thing is we got a lot of smart people and it gives them um, job security because certainly on the regulatory <laughs> side it's constantly evolving all right. So um, one of the other things that, that came up and one of the reasons we actually put this virtual roundhouse together is that um, we wanted to sort of at least be able to use this time where we can't meet in person to connect people virtually to talk about all the different issues. Because, you know, we all tend to get siloed. We get, tend to get stuck in our industry. We focus on our industry's needs. But um, we've had some great crossover conversations with different groups over the course of the, the virtual roundhouse. So as the representative for the oil and gas industry, um, what's the best way for other businesses and other interest groups um, to learn about how your industry operates, to learn about what you're, I, I think you guys frequently take a, take a hard, a bad rap for, um, as an industry, but you know, you do a lot of things well and you do a lot of things right. And you have, as you said, you have a lot of smart people, you know, following the rules and and trying to make things work. So what's the best way for people to learn about some of that stuff? And also then how can they partner with you to communicate to their policymakers, both at the state level and the federal level about how important your industry is and 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 to be supportive of you? Thank you. I, I appreciate that, that your statement as well as your question. So thank you first and foremost for recognizing that um, it is hard. I mean, we certainly, are not immune to um, criticism, and it's fair. I mean, look, if we're we're the we're the largest industry in the state, and um, you know, dogs they don't bark at parked cars. So you know, we're we are moving. We oh are, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, we 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 certainly I think are it's our job to you know we, to respond to that criticism and to acknowledge it and to listen to people's concerns and we take that obligation very seriously um, I think the way the best way to connect with us is through our our website or our social media platforms I mean we should if anyone it, it's not hard to find us we are we are like flow from progressive we're all over the place on social media and on the web um, our website is www.nmoga.org uh, but we're very active in terms of content creation on Facebook. And if you go to our website, you can contact one of our staff members. We have a lot. We have a, an outstanding staff um, and really our director of community engagement is a woman named Gloria Ruiz. And Gloria comes from a public education background. And, you know, her her gift has been really trying to create opportunities for us to to talk to people and to have conversations with with different uh, individuals and leaders outside of the oil patches. 
right? I mean, we, we have, the one thing I would point out about our industry is that the communities where we operate, the, the communities who are, who are actually most burdened by our industry because of truck traffic or noise, um, you know, those communities are the most supportive of the oil and gas industry. And it, it doesn't boil down to, you know, we look at these issues and it really doesn't boil down to political party. Um, it really it really boils down to familiarity with the industry. And the more people get to know our industry, the more they understand who we are and the more we can listen to their concerns and have an intelligent conversation about what their questions are, the more people support us. And we found that time and time again. And so Gloria's really done a great work working within communities in New Mexico where they don't see us. They don't interact with us every day. We don't, our children don't go to school together there. We're not at, at, you know, out socializing together. It's, you know, we're in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Las Cruces and all these other great portions of the state that get benefits of the industry. We felt like it was important to make sure we're, we're talking to people and business groups and, and partnering as much as possible. And so that's been, that's been a major initiative of ours. You can certainly get information on how to contact Gloria. She's very visible on our website. You can, um, and we'd be happy to connect with anybody. And that that not only goes to speaking with the groups or attending your meetings. I mean, it's it's also about supporting the causes that you care about in your community. I mean, we we not only are really interested in making sure we're responding to concerns and educating people about our industry, we're also very interested in making sure that we're extending our outreach from a community giving perspective outside of the oil patch. And so we've been very active through our community impact program called the Brighter Future Fund to make sure we're, we're providing grants to different causes and foundations and issues all throughout the state. And Gloria manages that as well. So we, we not only wanna to get to know you, we wanna to get to know what you care about and figure out how we can work with you. So um, please don't hesitate to contact Gloria and we'd love to we'd love to start to talk to you and have a conversation. Perfect. And I, I think it's important that people recognize um, how much you do contribute because the one thing that's come up through the virtual roundhouse, the common core issue that everybody comes back to is education and making sure that we support the education department and and you know how important it is for the future of of children, but also how important it is for every business to have an educated workforce that they can tap into and that. And then that there's an educated workforce that you touched on this earlier that can be used as a recruiting tool. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I look well, forward to getting to work with you to talk about how important, how much you're involved in the education department. So do you want to, you want to touch just a little bit more on that? Cause I, I think that's frequently overlooked as to what a, what a foundation you are for, for funding education. Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, the revenue, like I said, $1.4 billion to public education last year, we're with the industry is by far and away the largest, funder of public education in New Mexico. So again, you, you, you can't, you, you're, you don't have opportunities, whether it be to provide free college tuition to each New Mexican, something we, we've supported and continue to support, or teacher raises, uh, or you know, creating increasing opportunities for early childhood development. You know, those types of opportunities are made possible by the strength of the oil and gas industry. But you know, we also, believe that and I, and I think we've seen this well certainly i've seen I, I i taught for a couple of years before i went to law school so i i have an appreciation of how difficult it is to stand in front of a room of kids every day and and how how really hard it is to be a teacher and how valuable it is to be a teacher to to our society and to our children so i think it's we, we also want to make sure we're we're supporting teachers and, and making sure as we're also supporting parents though as well uh, so we've you know, I think we've seen over this last year that it it's it takes a full community to be behind children and teachers in order to make sure we're able to to get the type of results we want. There's no there's no silver bullet. If it was easy, New Mexico wouldn't continue to be behind the rest of the country when it comes to addressing these problems. And it's not just based on money either. It's, it takes a variety of different tools to help increase outcomes, whether it be ensuring people have opportunities to, for out of school um, you know, learning, which we've been a strong supporter of through the NM Most, the New Mexico Out of School Time Network, uh, or it's providing opportunities for teachers to, to really 
hone their their skills and their craft. And we're the, we're we've sponsored the New Mexico Teacher of the Year program for the last couple of years since its inception in order to provide a sabbatical or educational learning resources for the teacher of the year. Um, and you know, we, we do events all over the state where we really try to recognize teachers and we support um, different um, schools. We, we, did, we had a really fun program a couple of years ago where we, um, we went and did a makeover for teachers lounges all across the state. And, and you know, again, the goal was just to show teachers we appreciate them and we want to give them a professional setting where they could actually you know, take a break and enjoy their lunch. Um, we've also done a lot of work with backpack giveaways, school supplies, um, scholarship opportunities. We, we, we're a big sponsor of uh, Mana de Albuquerque, which is an amazing program. Um, so we're, we're really heavily involved throughout the educational community. And I think, you know, like I said, this last year, having to, to return to teaching part time to help my children in virtual learning. It not only made me more appreciative of what their teachers do inside the classroom, but also having to then entertain them after school, it made it gave me an appreciation of what we have to do outside the classroom to help reinforce the, the outcomes and the concepts they're learning during their, their, uh, their academic day. So um, we really try to be involved um, as much as possible. And our goal is really, we want to avoid any type of political issues when it comes to education. We just want to give teachers a platform and focus on outcomes for students. And I think our experience is that we know how to produce energy and we're good at that. And we're going to let the educational leaders, the educators, we're going to let them um, figure out how to get better outcomes from an educational perspective. So our, our approach has been to support teachers, educators at all levels and um, and really try to help them do their jobs better and not to pretend like we have all the answers because we don't. We're good at we're good at drilling wells, at moving hydrocarbons safely, at um, at doing our oil and gas work. We're not if we were if we were good at teaching, we'd be we'd be doing that instead of uh, engineering and working in the oil field. Perfect. Um, so before we let you go, um, I'm just going to check and see if we have any more questions that have come in. Let me just. Yeah, I think we're good there. So again, before before we let you off the hook, um, what's the what's the primary message you want to get out there um, to New Mexicans for in regards to the legislative session that's cur currently going on? What's what's your What's your one big takeaway for the 2021 New Mexico legislative session? Do no oh. harm. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that would be my message. I mean, really, we should be focusing on, on a public health crisis and on economic recovery. And, you know, our industry is poised to help lead us from an economic recovery perspective. There's no reason why, I mean, really, the only reason why we should be facing a revenue crunch or challenge next year will be because of policy decisions that are made right now at the state and federal levels. If, you know, if we continue to make smart policy decisions, and I'm not saying no policy decisions, I mean smart policy decisions. I mean, Governor Lujan Grisham just finished a rulemaking on methane emissions that's going to make New Mexico have the most stringent regulatory landscape of any in the country. So we can work, we can work collaboratively on regulations that'll help increase the environmental oversight of our industry. It's not deregulation or, or just ignoring the industry. I mean, we need we, we recognize the important role of oversight, but there's, there's a way to be collaborative and solution-centered when it comes to these challenges, and then there's a way to be punitive and harm the industry and therefore harm the state. And so my hope is that people will, will work with the industry in order to allow us to lead the state through this economic recovery and to continue to deliver for the state and for our schools. And I hope it, with three weeks to go, a little less than three weeks to go, our legislators will do no harm. That is a perfect summary. So um, thank you for that. Thank you again for all this thank information. You, um, and we may have you back on the 16th just to talk about a wrap up of what's actually happened during the session, but um, I'm glad we got to hear from your industry because it is, again, it's it's an economic driving force for the entire state. So thank you for making time for us. I know it's busy for you during this session. So we'll let you get back to it and um, we'll have you back. 
Thank you so much, Kathy.